Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, one second. Share screen. Can you guys see my, oops, let's see, display settings. Can you see my presentation? Can I just see a couple of shakes of the head? Yes, if you can. Okay, perfect. And you can move that over. Okay. So, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we do here in New York State. And so I'm just gonna jump straight in um, and talk a little bit about our workflow on the laboratory side for each of our pathogens. Um, we start off with, um, with an isolate being received. So I'm gonna talk first about Listeria. We start off with a pathogen, um, an isolate being received. That is then transferred to what we call the core lab here in New York State. Um, we have a specific lab that does whole genome sequencing for a variety of different pathogens, whether it's tuberculosis, um, something for that's more healthcare epi, um, you know, staff oriented or um, or otherwise antibiotic resistant. So all the, that ISO gets sent to the core lab. It's placed on a MySeq machine which can run 16 to 20 samples of, of any bacteria on a run. So even if we don't have a 16 listeria, which we rarely do um, to put on the machine, it can be combined with other samples. So whole genome sequencing is completed. There's a quality assessment that's done and the data is shared with federal and state collaborators. And specifically, the analysis occurs within bionumerics. And we look at within zero to, reporting a cluster is anything within zero to 30 alleles. We, um, our lab looks nationally um, within 120 days, but they also then look against our New York State specific database um, in its entirety, not just limiting it by 120 days. When the analysis is complete, it's reported to the New York EPIs. And that entire time frame has been taking about seven days from the time the isolate is received to the time clusters get reported to the epidemiologist. For STEC, um, once an isolate is obtained or received, again, right now we're doing PSGE in conjunction with whole genome sequencing. Um, so it gets sent to both labs. I'm only gonna speak to the whole genome sequencing process here. Um, STECs are also placed on a MySeq, so again, so that 16 to 20 samples on a run, and it can be combined um, with other pathogens. Whole genome sequencing is completed, the quality assessment is done, data is shared with federal and state collaborators. We do do analysis in-house for our STEC, um, and what we ask that the lab report to us is that um, any two or more isolates that are within 20 SNFs within the past 365 days. Um, and then they go ahead and they complete that analysis and report any clusters to EPI. For Salmonella, oh, actually just to go back a second. So that time frame is taking on average about 10 days. There are times it's longer than that, but that, that's about an average. Where things really change is salmonella. Um, again, an isolate is either obtained or received in our lab. Uh, we are still running PFGE and whole genome sequencing in parallel. The difference with um, whole genome sequencing here is all these isolates are being batched and they're going on a next seek machine. So when whole genome sequencing is completed, again, it goes through the quality assessment, the data sharing, we have some, we basically have some very specific um, algorithms in place for conducting analysis. Um, analysis is being done in-house and through NCBI, but it's specific to Salmonella typhimerium and Salmonella enteritidis. For Salmonella typhimerium, it's two or more Salmonella typhimerium within zero to 10 SNPs and within a 90-day window get reported to us. 
on then where with Salmonella and Aridotus, it's three or more within zero to five SNPs and within a 60 day window. And then that gets reported to us. If you look at the time frame, you'll see this is where the big um, variable the variance is. It can take um, up to a week to 60 days. And I would say lately, it's, it, it, on some of the salmonellas, it's been taking that full 60 days to be able to get analysis back. Um, and so sometimes there is quite a large time frame. So just to let you know what happens once these clusters um, and get reported to epidemiologists first, how they're getting reported um, via email. We get reported um, any cluster IDs, whether the, um, it's, a, it's a New York State specific cluster ID that we have or part of a national cluster. We also get the isolate IDs. Um, both are Le Wadsworth Lab accession number and the PNUSA number associated with the cluster. We also will find out if there's any other specimens or sample that cluster and their IDs, um, and especially if they're IDs in other states. Um, in some situations, we'll get a PDF of the trees, and we can always request a SNP matrix or allele matrix from um, our lab if we so desire, but we, we really predominantly are working off of them notifying us via email what clusters and then looking at the trees. Um, all this information is entered into a SharePoint site. Both laboratorians and epidemiologists have access to it. Both go in and update um, the, the records. The result of the investigation can be included so the laboratory is aware and we're finding that the SharePoint site, although it needs some tweaking, is helping us with metrics for some of our grant, um, grant deliverables. So um, just to let you know, once, um, once it gets reported to EPI, an investigation ensues um, for the clusters that get reported from the lab, we really go through our normal process. We review our initial questionnaire, which for the most part is, um, is about 80% of what the national hypothesis generating questionnaire um, is. Um, if there are other states involved, we'll contact other states and assess for commonalities and notify partners. Particularly for Salmonella, sometimes Epi will identify the cluster, um, either because there's an increase in Salmonella in a locality or because it's being driven, um, we already know from by PSGE. Um, which will be a big change for us um, shortly. So at that point, we might ask um, if it's a Salmonella serotype outside of Salmonella typhimerium and Enteritidis for the lab to prioritize those samples for sequencing and analysis. Um, and so we can try to get results a little bit quicker. Um, we actually go ahead and we look up the PNUSA numbers in CEDRIC. Um, we'll go ahead and review NCBI, um, and if there's other cases that cluster, we'll look up the PNUSA numbers in CEDRIC to determine which state um, or entity um, the cases are from um, and contact that other state or entity to go through our normal investigation process. So um, I just wanted to put a plug in. We also hold routine meetings. Um, we meet monthly. And a standing agenda item at all these meetings is to review our thresholds. Um, so I think I mentioned um, where you know we might have said two or more isolates within 60 days or within 90 days. So we review those thresholds and any changes that may need to be made. Um, and changes can be made on sniffer allele differences, time frames, and we often talk about whether we have any data to drive those decisions. And sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, sometimes it's a logistic piece. Um, but it's also an opportunity for us to provide some investigation updates, and I think it's something that's been valued on both ends um, as we've been doing this. I will end here, and I'll hand it back off to, I'll stop sharing and hand it back off to Paula. I think on. the next speaker is just, uh, I think the order was decided, Colorado next. I think Rachel said, Rachel's talking and Logan? Yep. I think that we are up now. So 
Hi everyone, I'm Logan from Colorado, um, and I'm gonna be speaking with Rachel. And so um, I just wanted to, to go over a little bit of our uh, lab epi kind of like collaboration, and we have a, a specific example that we're gonna be showing you, but um, first to start things off, uh, the lab and the epis here in Colorado have a, a really good working relationship. Uh, we get together every Thursday morning over Zoom, kind of similar to this, where we have the, the Hollywood Squares and everybody gets together and we share anything that, that's happening either from the lab side that we see or um, the epis will, will tell us about things that they're seeing. <laughs> so there you go, we have a, a picture of one of our, our Thursday morning meetings right there. Um, and this, this helps, I, I think, Having a really good working relationship um, helps the, the collaboration a, a lot and it, it kind of like greases things along and, and we really have a, a good kind of um, back and forth. So uh, in that vein, I am Ping and I think Rachel is Pong. So we were gonna have ping pong battles to pass it back and forth, but <laughs> we couldn't find the battles. So I'm, I'm just gonna say Ping. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so we also often uh, like to collaborate outside of work hours, so we do also have routine happy hours, and here's a demonstration of us enjoying our time together. So if you haven't noticed already, we are utilizing the chat feature um, in place of slides, so um, check out what's happening in chat to get the kind of text to go along with what um, Ping and I are saying. Um, so the example we're gonna, gonna talk through today involves Shigella. So on the EPI side, like many other seats, we saw an increase in Shigella cases, um, predominantly impacting men who have sex with men, and kind of the tipping point for us was an outbreak of Shigella among restaurant workers that we were concerned about foodborne transmission and then learned that these individuals were actually sexual partners, so it was probably person-to-person -person spread, but it made us realize that we had a lot to learn about um, Shigella, so Pong. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, so what we did after that is um, we had a routine Shigella workflow in place where we were um, sequencing all the, the Sonii isolates, so Shigella Sonii, um, but we realized that we wanted to take a, a bigger look at, at all of the Shigella, so the flexneurize as well. Um, and so uh, Rachel sent us a list of, of all these isolates and uh, we were looking at them and we found that some of them were flexnerized and some of them were sonyized. And so we decided that we needed to change our, our workflow a little bit. And so um, we put in a, a request for additional sequencing of the flexnerized and uh, it actually ended up working out really well because what we do here in Colorado is we have a MySeq as well. Um, we actually have two MySeqs and so they're constantly being, um, it's usually about one run a week and we try to fill up the run as, as full as we can uh, before we, we run it. And so what was happening is that um, we had all these, these uh, legacy isolates, I guess you would say. So like from, from 2017 and uh, 18, um, that we wanted to sequence and, and take a look at what was going on with those. And so we were, we were filling up the rest of the runs with um, the, the rest of the uh, Shigellas that we wanted to see. And so after that, we decided that uh, once we got an, enough uh, isolates together, um, we started doing kind of a, a um, bioinformatics workflow. And so we, we started uh, working them up bioinformatically and we created, um, what we do is we, we make trees and then we also make um, pairwise SNP matrices that go along with the trees. And so we can kind of see uh, kind of their, their spatial relationship, and then we can also see kind of like SNP relationships um, at the same time. And so uh, we made this tree, and Rachel got the tree. I got a tree, and that was excellent. Um, and one of the things we do on our Thursday morning meetings, and one of the reasons that we use video conferencing, um, I joke that Logan and his counterparts are job, one of their jobs is to make sure that I don't misinterpret or misrepresent their data, which I think as epidemiologists, we're sympathetic to people misusing our data. So it's, it's I'm very comfortable having a babysitter for my use of whole genome sequencing data. Um, so when when Logan presented this to us, he shared it on a, on a call and I said, great, I'm gonna start pairing this with our epi data. I'm gonna look closer. Oh, crap, what's a PNUSA number? So, um, Madhu referred to this as if this is just like a totally normal thing in her world, but that's not an ID that I'm used to seeing. That's an ID that our lab colleagues are used to seeing around PulseNet 
Um, but that is not something I'm comfort comfortable with, not something I initially knew how to link back to our case data. So I went back to Logan and was like, so about that number. <laughs> so it was really easy for us to um, just kind of like go back and forth and where it would have taken a lot of time to you know go through these PNUSAs and and manually update for Rachel um, we have a list of all the PNUSAs and how they refer back to our state IDs and so I was able to replace those kind of quickly on our tree um, and it just goes to show that you know uh, communication is key so then I got the tree part two and let me share my screen and show you, oh, you get to see our screenshots again. So this is the tree I got. Um, obviously, this just shrunk to a size that you couldn't possibly see it. Um, but what you're seeing is that there's a clear um, clustering of some different um, groups. And down in the bottom right corner of the um, SNP matrices are the outbreaks um, that are genetically related to each other and very similar to other outbreaks that are disproportionately affecting MSM um, elsewhere in the United States. So awesome. I love getting lab data that matches our epi data. And in many ways, this was reassuring to us. We haven't completely missed the boat epi-wise. We're not wasting our resources. Great. What I love a little bit less is discovering that we've missed outbreaks. And because we weren't doing routine um, whole genome sequencing on both the Sony I and Flexneri, um, we hadn't detected this cluster up here. And when we looked into it a little more closely, it turns out that these were a bunch of like elementary school aged kids in kind of neighboring uh, counties in northern Colorado, and this was some sort of outbreak among school aged kids that we completely missed. So while it's a little um, disappointing to find out that you missed an outbreak, I think it was a really great reminder for us of how much richer our data is going to be with whole genome sequencing and sort of on the epi resource side, preparing for what it's going to be like when we can detect, um, detect more outbreaks and how are we going to manage that. Um, so in terms of combining epi data and lab data, that's been a challenge on our end. Um, I'm loving watching you guys squint to read my comments. I forgot about the font size in chat, sorry. Um, so we have all this rich multi-dimensional data that Logan is producing bioinformatically speaking. And then I have, you know, an Excel spreadsheet. So how do we take this deep multiple relational data and compare it to flat epi data? Um, so right now we are struggling and making do, um, but we have hopes and dreams of using MicroReact, which our colleagues in Minnesota introduced us to. And this is a free open source software that we just need our Office of Information Technology to give us permission to use um, to link, to maintain the depth of the lab whole genome sequencing data while pairing the epi data. Um, and it's quite, it's quite powerful. It looks really user friendly. It looks straightforward. So we are embarking on perhaps our biggest challenge around whole genome trans sequencing transition, which is getting OIT permission to use a new free open source software. Um, so we're really hopeful we can do that um, in the next few months, um, just to have um, a really dynamic platform that we can be looking at the data at the same time. Because when I pull up the epi data, I want Logan there to, to add the lab perspective and vice versa. So. Anything else? I think so. I think um, you covered everything. <laughs> All right, we'll pass it back to you, Paula. <laughs>
um, side of uh, communication considering considerations that we've had with sequencing. Um, I'm going to uh, start off a little bit with um, on the laboratory side, but I'm not going to go in too much depth on it. Uh, okay. Oh, I see. All right, so here's, here's a little bit of information about um, the amount of sequencing that we've done. Um, you can see we started in, in 2013 with, with Genome Tracker, um, and now by 2018, we, we are on pace to sequence about 5,000 um, isolates this year. And uh, all through the years, we've been adding a lot of different um, organisms to our sequencing capacity. And that has been great because we are using our sequencing more efficiently and we have more people that are doing the sequencing and using the results of the efficient, uh, sequencing. Um, on the, but it does produce a number of challenges. Um, you have a, a huge number of projects and um, you have some challenges on the laboratory side, um, you know, trying to get all of the work done in, a, in an orderly way. Um, and you know, understanding priority, prioritization. And then you have challenges on the epidemiology side, making sure that your counterparts are able to utilize the information as, as well as possible. So um, uh, as some of the other states talked about, we have developed a, uh, on the laboratory side, uh, uh, NGS core model. So we can sequence um, pretty much any organism on, on the same batch. Um, we, we get the um, um, DNA that's been uh, undergone quality control um, and quantif quantification, and then the core does the sequencing and outputs the raw sequence uh, data file for uh, analysis. Um, and sometimes the core will do the analysis, sometimes they'll help with the analysis, or sometimes the analysis will be done by other scientists. So the goals of the core are to um, create a, a standardized workflow that can uh, always produce um, high quality sequence data, no matter what the organism, um, the bioinformatic has, uh, an analysis that is needed, um, whether there's different library preparations or, or reagents, um, no matter what those circumstances, we want to create um, one fairly standardized workflow that we can uh, do our work as efficiently as possible, um, also with the highest quality as possible, and provide training so everyone is doing things the same way. And currently, we have five people on our, our uh, NGS core. So when we were going to start a project, and I talked about the number of different projects, um, uh, the, the, the first thing that we do is uh, uh, have an in-person meeting to discuss a wide variety of things. Um, number one is, you know, why do we need the project? How big is the project? Kind of get an idea of the scope of, of what is being done. Also, we need to have money. Um, so we talk about funding, uh, get to, uh, get to uh, finances right away. Um, but then we talk about what are the needs of the customer. Or whoever is um, promoting this project really needs to be involved with what um, the results are going to look need to look like. So, um, what is the urgency? Do they need samples turned around right uh, as soon as possible, or can they be batched, um, or or is a monthly fine? Um, what kind of analysis do they need? How long how long do they need for the analysis and um, interpretation issues. Um, so all of those are things that, that we talk about. And, you know, from a laboratory side, um, you know, that we create this great data, but without the epi context, um, we really don't have uh, data that is super useful. So um, my feeling is that that collaboration between laboratory and epidemiology or laboratory and, and the end user of the sequencing data is really the best way to get useful and re relevant information. So it's really vital to have that communication uh, piece up front. So one thing that we do is on, on the laboratory side is um, we really try to think of it as our, our results as being customer focused. 
um, in, in layman's term, what is the best way to get across the most significant and actionable uh, uh, information to our uh, epidemiologists and laboratorium? So a couple of the things that we do is, you know, I talked about the sit-down meeting, um, and what, uh, some of the things that we do at this meeting is evaluate what is the sequencing knowledge of the end user. Um, you know, our foodborne epidemiologists are very savvy um, at uh, analysis of, of sequencing uh, results at this point, but some of our other epidemiologists um, have not had that background. So uh, oftentimes we will have to bring people uh, up to speed on the um, what sequencing can do and the terminology so that everyone can speak the same language. Um, it's, I think it's really important to seek input on what the results need to look like. Um, in the end, we need to provide results to our end users that they can use that's in, in, a, in a form and in a time frame that's as helpful for, for them as possible. So that's where uh, a, a lot of conversations are really, are really um, necessary. Um, after you've started working on a project, it's important to evaluate their experience um, with the project and then make improvements. Um, you know, initially when you start a project, um, you know, you have one idea, but things change over time. People, people, people's knowledge change. They might not as need more, as much information, or in some cases they might, might need more information. It's really important to continually have those conversations. Um, and then also just uh, continually meet and have that open, open communication. And, if you have performance measures on, on, on turnaround times or any other measures, um, track those measures so that we can make sure that everyone's needs have been met. So we communicate with our epidemiologists uh, with a, in a variety of area, in, in a variety of means. Um, and there is not really one size that, that fits all of our epidemiologists. Um, emails, uh, shared data files and calls or in-person meetings are, are all, um, you know, very good ways of, of meeting. And it really depends on the needs of the project um, and the urgency of the project. Um, and I'm going to give one example um, here. This is um, with our foodborne epidemiologist. Um, initially, we were creating trees and dendrograms and heat maps and sending them to it and giving really pretty long, long-winded explanations of this and having a lot of uh, conversation. Um, but as our epidemiologists got more comfortable with, with trees and the information and got very comfortable with the, the type of data that NGS was able to provide, uh, we really narrowed that down, the, da the data that they want. Um, and so that it, it's really just data that um, cuts to the chase, provides the information that they need to perform the next steps. Um, so if you look at uh, this at, at the top, it says cluster 2017001. Um, there's two new isolates to this cluster. So this is a Minnesota cluster designation. Um, and you can tell that they're one to five SNPs. So we know that's pretty closely related. Um, that's a pretty significant. Um, that cluster now has eight isolates total. <coughs> and uh, since this is already a pre-existing cluster, we've already assigned an epidemiologist, in this case it's Marika, who is the lead uh, uh, epidemiologist investigating this cluster. And uh, um, SE11B6 is our, our Minnesota pulse field designation so that they can understand how pulse field will um, uh, correspond to um, sequencing data. If you go down a couple, you can see that um, in, in, in red, uh, we say it's a new cluster. And, and so it'll give a little bit more information on those new clusters. And obviously an epidemiologist has not been assigned yet because it is a new cluster. Um, oh, I, you know what? Uh, I, one of my slides got cut off, um, but I did want to say, uh, um, the last slide I was going to show is we do have a, a joint spreadsheet um, that all of our isolates get uh, added into the spreadsheet, which will have more information that our epidemiologists can use um, um, to do a little bit deeper dive um, into uh, the, the information that will include the PNUSA number. Um, and also, 
you know, a lot of dates and times and pulse field information. Um, and also it'll give some information on whether, uh, you know, we define a cluster as anything that within five SNPs that has been seen within 60 days, but we'll, we'll uh, make a note of it if it's been seen uh, past 60 days. Um, so that, that's important for epidemiologists to know. And we do uh, have our trees, our demograms, and um, heat maps um, that are available to our epidemiologists. Um, and they can always, uh, uh, they're in a shared file, they can look them up. But at this point, it's actually quite rare that our epidemiologists will do that. Um, they, they really feel that um, this communication method works um, really well for them on the foodborne side. Um, and we have a little bit different communication on different projects. Legionella, it's much more just an email based. Um, but each project is kind of is, is, is its own enti en entity. And lastly, I would say that, you know, as we're transitioning to bionumerics, um, we're going to be spending a, a lot of um, additional time with our epidemiologists, um, kind of creating a new workflow and uh, optimizing that so that we can communicate the information that is necessary for them as soon as possible. So I think that's about it for me. I guess it's uh, time for questions.